This series is a look at the Christmas story, metaphysically and mystically. This week, Reverend Wendy continues to look at ways for us to explore our world from a spiritual perspective. So I bet you can't guess what the topic is. <laughs> oh, you are so smart. You are so smart. And yes, the, the topic is faith. I've entitled the lesson, What Are You Following? Faith or Fear? What are you following, faith or fear? So I encourage you to keep that question center in your mind as I share some, some ideas with you this morning. And I actually do want to begin by sharing a, a couple of the, the readings that I shared this morning at the contemplative service. The first one is from author and teacher Bob Proctor. Faith and fear both demand you believe in something you cannot see. Think about that. Faith and fear both demand that you believe in something you cannot see. You get to choose. And here is one from um, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 that I've always, always loved. And it is this, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. Not a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. And this last one that I absolutely adore from, Mar from Margaret Shepherd: Sometimes your only available transportation is a leap of faith. <laughs> Isn't that good? Sometimes your only available transportation is a leap of faith. And as I look around the room, I know some of you better than others of you. I know some of your journey and some of the things that you are dreaming about or, or contemplating. And I really want to encourage you to listen deeply to the guidance that will come through you this morning as you think about these ideas of faith and fear. And think about the idea that sometimes maybe the only transportation at your disposal is going to be that, here I go, a leap of faith. So there are certainly times in our life when faith is easy, and faith is easy when life is easy. Faith tends to be more challenging when life is difficult, which is the time that we need it the very most. So we're going to take a look at the Christmas story, a part of the Christmas story, um, the story of the shepherds. And as I read this story to you from Luke, I'd like you to just kind of notice certain key words or, or points that maybe might have something to do with the spiritual journey. And then I'm going to share with you five of them that I think have something to do with the spiritual journey. But, but I encourage you to listen and see if you come up with any of the same that I've come up with or if you come up with some of your own. So here it is from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20 from the New International Version of the Bible. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. So if you've been a student of unity or new thought or science of mind for any length of time, you know that the Bible has a unique place in our teaching. We do not take it literally. We do not take it as the infallible, inerrant word of God. But that doesn't mean we throw it out completely. What it does mean is that we look at it through 
mystical, metaphorical, and metaphysical eyes. And we look at the various elements of the Christmas story, or any other part of the Bible for that matter, to see what it might reveal to us of our own soul's awakening and journeying toward the light or toward enlightenment or awareness, whatever word we want to put on that state of being more, more um, conscious. And so with this part of the story, we do the same thing. We look and say, okay, well, what are some of the elements and what might be going on here that might point to something I can uh, learn and apply in my spiritual journey and growth? So here's the first that I would share with you. On the spiritual path, you must pay attention to what you pay attention to, especially at night. <laughs> Meaning, especially in the dark times of our lives. The shepherds were out in the field watching their flock, we're told, by night, at night. I have read that verse, that whole Christmas story part, so many times, and I've heard it so many times, but just yesterday when I was going over my notes again, which I always do, what struck me was not just that they were keeping watch over their flock, but those words, at night. And that was a powerful insight to me that yes, we teach in metaphysics the importance of paying attention to what gets our attention. We say what gets our attention gets us. Where, en where attention goes, energy flows. We understand the importance of paying attention. But what really stood out to me was the value of applying that, especially in the dark, challenging moments of our lives. You know, to pay attention to our attention, to pay attention to our thoughts when we're working on our dreams and our goals and we're excited and we're working on our visions, that has a very different feel and it's very necessary and important and beneficial than also applying that same conscientiousness in paying attention when we're in that dark and scary place in our lives. I noticed and I shared this with, I think I shared it with this service last week, that John and I are going through a bit of a challenge in, in our life right now that's really testing our faith. And what's been helpful to me is to grab hold of these teachings even deeper than I have for all the years and decades now that I've studied them. And to really understand how critical it is to do this at the very moments that it seems so easy to give up and say, oh, this is just so hard. It's just so hard. The truth doesn't change being the truth just because the circumstances are difficult. Pay attention to that. The truth doesn't change being the truth just because the situation or the circumstances are darker or more challenging. So we have the shepherds paying attention to their flock at night, paying attention when things are dark and not very clear. What is it that we must be paying attention to? They were paying attention to their flock. They were paying attention to the sheep. Those sheep were their livelihood. Those sheep were critically important to their prosperity, to their well-being. But we know that most, of, I don't think any of us in this room have pet sheep, do we? We're not paying attention to it. We have other things on the worldly plane that we need to pay attention to, but this is at a deeper level. So what is it that we are to pay attention to? We know from our practice of metaphysics that we are to pay attention to the quality of our thinking. The quality of our thinking. I know you know this if you've been in unity or science of mind for any length of time. But just because we know something and have heard it a million times doesn't mean that there still isn't room to improve our application and consistency of the principle. I was reminded of this piece and I looked it up this morning to make sure that I got it right, from Frank Outlaw. He wrote, watch your thoughts, for they become words. Watch your words, for they become actions. Watch your actions, for they become habits. Watch your habits, for they become character. Watch your character, for it will become your destiny. A lot of times we wait until it's all the way out there in circumstances or all the way out there in our character or our destiny and we go, oh my God, I better do some work now. Wouldn't it be easier, and it is easier actually, 
if we become and remain vigilant at the front end, and the front end is at the end of consciousness, to pay attention, and when we catch ourselves thinking and holding a certain mental energy, a certain feeling that we know is counterproductive to what we want to create in our lives, that we stop it as soon as we notice it. And we may have to stop it again, and again, and again, and again, because have you noticed how the mind just seems to go in circles sometimes, and it takes repetition to stop it and to pick a different thought, to substitute a different thought. Second from the story, on the spiritual path, we acknowledge our fear. We don't say we're not afraid if we're afraid. It's okay to be afraid. We acknowledge our fear, but we move forward with our faith. We acknowledge our fear, but we move forward with our faith. If we never moved forward with our faith, we would stay very, very stuck in a very small dimension of our lives. Anything significant and new that you've done in your life, I bet you required yourself to move through a bit of anxiety or fear or self-doubt or worry, am I right? Oh my God, when I sat in a Unity Church, the, it was called Christ Church Unity on Altadena with Reverend Robert Stevens in the 70s, and I had the flash, I'm going to be up one day speaking as a minister, I thought, I don't want to say the word I thought, well, I'll say the word I thought, hell no, I can't do that, I'm too afraid to even think that thought. I don't know how to stand in front of a group of people and talk. I don't want to stand in front of a group and people and talk. I dropped out of speech in junior college because I had to stand up and give a two minute talk about myself. <laughs> I wanna make sure you get the picture of why the energy behind the, the hell no. So there was no doubt I was acknowledging the fear. <laughs> No doubt about that. But there was still something beneath that that obviously I paid attention to or I wouldn't be here with you now. And I know that that's true for all of us. I know that we can feel smaller than what we're being called or invited to do or we can feel challenged by circumstances that we've never been in before with kinds of people or situations that are alien to us, that we can feel tiny and small and insignificant sometimes in comparison to that. But just because we feel those feelings of fear does not mean that there also resides in us that spirit of courage, that spirit of faith. I believe literally in the words, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. A third from our friends the shepherds, on the spiritual path, you've gotta be present and available to spirit. Present and available to spirit. Where do I get that from in the story of the shepherds? I get that from the fact that they, they were open to, or they recognized the angels that came to them. In other words, what, the way we look at that metaphysically is angels are those divine ideas, those divine insights or guidance that we get, oftentimes in the dark moments of our lives, that tell us, don't be afraid, something great is about to happen. They were available to that. They were not only available to that divine message, but they actually picked up and left where they were to go follow what that divine message told them to do. So it's not enough for you and for me to just be available to that divine message. When we get it, guess what? We need to act on it. We need to do something with it. So on the spiritual path, we've got to be available and present to spirit. Available and present, paying attention to that still small voice, that guidance, that nudge. When spirit calls you and says this, don't send the message to voicemail. 
<laughs> Pick up the phone and answer it. And trust that in the answering of it, you will also be given the courage to do at least the next step that will be required of you. The fourth, on the spiritual path, you will often be given signs that you're on the right path. I am so grateful for that. If you've ever taken a leap of faith, I bet you've been awfully glad when your feet landed and there was something around you that reassured you that things were gonna be okay. Maybe you didn't get everything when you landed all at once on a silver platter, but you got some sort of message or, or sign that, okay, made it there, that was safe. I followed my guidance, I took that leap, here's the sign, it's gonna be okay. The shepherds were told, you will find a babe laying in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. When we are on a spiritual journey, and when we ask to be guided, it's really important that we keep our ears and our eyes open, that we pay attention to the signs along the way. And sometimes, the signs are quite literally a sign. <laughs> and we go, oh my God, it might be a bumper sticker that says, no fear. And you've been wrestling with fear and wondering, oh God, just give me a sign, just give me a sign, and then you get the sign. No fear. It might be a book falls off your desk and opens to a page with just the answer that you've been looking for and your whole soul recognizes it, right? You've had this experience, I know you have. How do you know when it's a sign? I wish I could tell you there's one way that's foolproof. I wish I could tell you that it's always this way and never that way. But the truth of the matter is there are many ways that we can tell that a sign is a sign that we're on the right track. I can share with you some of my ways are. When I know that I've taken a leap of faith and that I'm doing what I'm being called to do, there's something inside of me where it just feels right. Doesn't mean I might not have doubt and fear, but it still just feels right. A little bit like that feeling when you're working on a really complicated jigsaw puzzle with a 1, thousand, fifteen hundred pieces, and you put that very last piece in. There's just something to it that it just feels right. Sometimes it's accompanied, the sign is accompanied with a sense of peace, a sense of relief as if your soul is just going, ah. Or it can be accompanied with this newfound energy or creativity that, wow, you don't know where it came from, but all of a sudden you've got this burst of energy, you've got this burst of creativity. Or sometimes the sign is a new door opens and you walk through that door, you cross that threshold and voila, there's something magical on the other side of that. So keep, we must keep on the spiritual journey we must keep our eyes open and look for the signs. Just like the shepherds, we're told you will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. They had a sign. Keep your eyes open for that sign. And the fifth is that on the spiritual path, it really helps to have a few companions to keep you moving along. It really, really helps to have a few companions to help keep you moving along. In some ways, I look at what we do together or what I do with you on a Sunday morning is almost like being a spiritual coach and cheerleader. You know, there's a point in which what I or anybody in my position um, does, which is to impart new information that maybe you've never heard before, the principles and the teachings and the practices and so forth. But after a while, when you've been on the path for, for a bit, you've heard these things before. And then I think that there's an element of whatever happens from the front of a room such as this that is really about spiritual cheerleading and, and encouragement. Because what I absolutely know to be true is that we are meant to be on this journey supporting one another spiritually. And that 
it is critically important in our lives not just to have good friends that we enjoy doing things with socially, but to make sure that in addition to that, whether they are the same people or not, that in addition to that, we have at least one or two people that are our spiritual partners, our spiritual cheerleaders, that we can turn to when we know my faith is wobbly right now. I know mentally what I need to be doing, but by golly, I don't seem to be doing it right now. Can you hold that for me? Can you see that for me? Can you believe that for me? Can I lean on your faith until mine becomes strong again? Does that make sense? If you don't have a person or two like that in your life, they're here. I mean that quite literally. They're here in this room right now. There are times that I need you to be strong for me and there are times that I need to be strong for you. There are times when I am up and you are down and vice versa. And isn't it great that we're usually at different points at the same time so we can support one another? Absolutely it is. So on the spiritual path, it helps to have a few companions to keep you moving along. Jesus did this himself. And he didn't pick perfect people. Did you notice that? His disciples were not perfect. In fact, they had an awful lot of problems, but they still believed in him and they still tried to, to follow what he taught before he really launched his ministry. Meaning before he really started to do his teaching, he gathered around him 12 to journey with him. And then if you also remember further along in his very short life, when he decided to send them out to further the teaching, he didn't send them out by themselves. He sent them out, do you remember how? By twos. By twos. By twos. He sent them out by twos. Why do you think he did that? Because he could only cover half the territory at the time, right? If you want to just go to efficiency. If you have 12 and you send 12 out as singles, then they can hit 12 times the area, right? But he didn't, he wasn't about that. He sent them out by twos, covering half the territory, if you will, if you want to look at it that way. But knowing that we need each other and that this spiritual work is easy and pretty simple to talk about, but it's not so easy to do, especially when it is the dark time of our life. I cannot tell you over the years of ministering how many times I have heard people in the Unity teaching saying, I left for several months because my life was falling apart. And I think that's the time to be here. <laughs> Don't go. And I think that in part, some of that is about a very shallow understanding of what metaphysics is about. While we absolutely encourage one another to always look for and call forth the highest and best, and we tend to be a very positive, focused practice, that sometimes people think that then that means when I'm hurting, when I'm angry, when I'm afraid, when I'm challenged, when I'm all alone, when everything is hitting the fan, that I can't be here because everybody's so gosh darn positive all the time. That's a bunch of hooey. <laughs> hooey. <laughs> we are meant to be together in the easy times and in the not so easy times. So very quick recap, metaphysics from the shepherds. Pay attention to where you put your attention, especially in the dark night of the soul time. Acknowledge your fear, but move forward with your faith. Three, be present and available to spirit. Four, pay attention to and look for the signs that you're on the right track. And five, be sure you have some spiritual cheerleaders. And if you don't, start looking here. Get involved in our spirit groups when we launch them uh, next month. They're there. Namaste. Thanks for listening. The Unity Center, transforming lives and healing our world. Check us out Sundays at 9 and 11. Subscribe to our podcasts and download our free app for instant access to a wealth of spiritual teachings, services, and events.